All right, guys and girls, back to another episode of Meta Management. Now, in the last episode, we've talked about needs. We've talked about the fact that individuals have certain needs. Um, but there's also this idea that, you know, humans don't work by themselves. They work in societies. And in a society, it's important to understand that other people have different needs, different opinions, different ideas. In this video, we're going to understand what this means. Like, how do we know other people have needs? How do we know other people have different ideas, different opinions? We will study the theory of mind. All right. So theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states like beliefs and desires to ourselves and to understand that others have beliefs, intentions, desires, and perspectives that are different from our own. When you like a potato, there's a possibility that another person could like tomatoes. Right. So human beings understand that mental states can be the cause of and predictor of behavior of other people. We learn the, about the theory of mind through disease states such as autism and schizophrenia. Um, autistic kids, for example, their needs, their ideas, they're very different. Right. And it's hard for them to associate or dissociate as we will learn in the future. So understanding attention involves understanding that seeing can be directed selectively as attention. So if you're just sitting here and a loud noise comes from the left, you will look there and you will look at it and you will look back. And that is a sign that you have paid attention, the minimal sign, right? So the looker assesses that the seen object as of interest. So if I hear a sound there and I look around, it means that I've paid attention to it. And this seeing can induce beliefs. Attention can be directed and shared by the act of pointing. So I could show somebody else and say, hey, look at that, right? And a joint attention behavior that requires taking into account another person's mental state. So the minute I point somewhere, another person looks at it, right? So the biggest or the best sign of attention is seeing. Now, there are other signs of attention. You could listen to something. You could hear a podcast or whatever. But we're going to talk about the simplest and the most basic idea of attention, which is I point at something and you look at it or some event happens and you look at it. Particular, particularly when the person notices an object or finds it of interest, right? So theory of mind forms um, typically during childhood. So it and continues developing during childhood. The first skill to develop in children is the ability to recognize that others have diverse desires. So a child before the age of two or three doesn't understand that other people have different desires from it, right? It, it believes that everyone has the same desires. But as a child grows up, it can learn that, hey, I really like oranges, but another person really likes apples. And that's okay. So children are able to recognize that others have diverse beliefs. So I might believe that the tooth fairy exists, but my friend might not believe that tooth fairies exist. So the idea of beliefs, which are not tangible objects, unlike an apple or an orange, those beliefs can be different. The next skill to develop is recognizing that others have access to different information sets. For example, a child might realize, hey, my mom has left, you know, the cookies somewhere. I don't know where it is, but my brother seems to know where it is. My brother has the data about it, right? So a child starts realizing that, you know, that's the next thing to develop. Then children are able to understand that others might have false beliefs and that others are capable of suppressing emotions. Right now, this, here's where it starts getting tricky because children start realizing that somebody could have a belief and that belief could be wrong. Right until the age of four, children don't understand that other people can be wrong. Right. Anyone who says that's why your parents probably warned you of giving you uh, of somebody giving you candy, especially when you were young, because you don't understand that those can be negative or false beliefs and that others are capable of suppressing emotions, which is another person could um, be really happy, but pretend to be, you know, normal. And the child realizes that, hey, maybe that person was happy, even though that person wasn't showing the emotion. Because until that point, if a person is smiling, that person's happy. If a person is sad, that person's sad, right? But children understand that people are capable of suppressing emotions at that point. Right. So in individualistic cultures like the United States, a greater emphasis is placed on individuality. Right. In a group first oriented culture such as China, this skill develops later. So this idea of theory of mind that other people can have false beliefs that actually develops in Chinese children much later than it develops in American children. Right. Because China, China is a more group oriented society. The best way to test whether a child um, knows about false beliefs is to give it the Sally Annie test. Right. So. The test goes like this. You tell a child a story, 
that there's a person called Sally and Sally has a basket. Then there's another person called Annie and Annie has a box, right? So Sally has a marble and she puts the marble into her basket, right? Sally goes out for a walk. Now Annie takes out the marble out of the basket and puts it in a box. Now Sally comes back and she wants to play with her marble. Where will Sally look for her marble? Now, most children can pass this test around the age of four, right? They will obviously say, look, Sally is going to check in the basket because she doesn't know that Annie has removed. She doesn't know that Annie has removed the marble and put it in the box. Sally has no idea of that information because she went out. She was not there. She doesn't have that information set or the information that somebody else has taken the ball out, right? But autistic children, surprisingly, cannot pass this test or children below the age of four cannot pass this test because they will say, well, Sally is going to look inside the box, right? Because they just look at the entire story and they see where the end result is. And they say, look, she just put it in the box. So Sally is going to come and look, put it in the box. But there is no way Sally could have known about this information, right? So children after the age of four understand this. They're able to see things through another person's perspective. That's what the advantage of having, of understanding false beliefs is, which is you can see or feel like another person. It's the basic idea of empathy. Right, which is how or what information set would Sally have in her head when she came back. And that is the basis of all empathy. Right. So the development of theory of mind and language happens parallelly in most children and most develop around the age of two to five, right? Two to five is decent. Four is, is when, you know, most children can pass the Sally Annie test. Adults have egocentric bias whereby they're influenced by their own beliefs and desires when judging those of other people and sometimes ignore other people's perspectives entirely. So the skill we learn as children to be able to see things from another person's perspective that only grows out to a certain extent in, in terms of this information set. But as adults, we believe that, you know, even though we know that Sally will probably look in the basket first, we don't apply the same rules to other things. We don't apply the same rules when it comes to, you know, understanding a little more about the world. We don't, we don't apply the same rules when it comes to is another person suffering? What would have another person gone through? We like to think that we know everything about the world and, you know, that our experience of the world is similar to another person's experience of the world almost entirely, right? And, but we know that's not true because we can all, most of us can pass the false belief test. So while we know that Sally doesn't have information about the ball, in many other more complex situations, we believe that everyone has full information about what they were doing. There's evidence that adults with greater memory and inhibitory capacity and greater motivation are more likely to step into other people's shoes and display greater empathy. So the more, the smarter you are, and the more you can regulate your emotions and the better motivation you have, the more likely you will be able to take another person's or step into another person's shoes, just like a child stepped into Sally's shoes while thinking about where the ball would be or the marble would be. In a sufficiently large group, a human being can abandon his or her third theory of mind and fall into full grown group conformity. And this is like, this is like the craziest part of the theory of mind, right? As you are an individual and as you're exercising your individuality, it's great. But the minute you fall into a group, you lose your theory of mind, right? You, you lose the ability to step into another person's shoes. You, you get into mob mentality, right? So here's an example of Ash's conformity test. I'm just going to play the video for you guys. Okay. I want to give you a test of your visual acuity, your sensitivity to differences in line lengths. So I'm going to show you a standard and then I'm going to show you three comparison lines. All right, so, you know, there's something about the cooperative versus deceptive societies. When, when another person is looking at us, one of the signs of attention is where our eyeballs move, right? So if I'm looking to the left, I can either turn my head to the left or I can just move my eyes to the left, right? The two ways, two ways to do it. The cooperative eye hypothesis suggests that eyes, that the eyes distinctive white sclera evolved to follow another human's gaze while communicating or while working together on tasks. You can see two product managers when they're talking about mockups, they're both looking at the same thing. So you know where another person's attention is. You know when a person is looking down at his phone, not paying attention, you know it, right? And it's actually that, that idea or principle is very critical to how humans work with each other, right? So other primates like monkeys have pigmented sclera. It's dark sclera that are brown and you can't see where monkeys are seeing. So if a monkey is looking at another monkey and maybe looking to the left, you can't see where its attention is. Monkeys live in deceptive societies. 
Studies of primate behavior show that they behave egotistically and in a self-centered way without too much theory of mind in situations, specific situations where there are motives for deception, giving way to the idea that their lack of cooperation is not a lack of their ability to, but rather an adaptation to a society that thrives on deception, right? Monkey societies thrive on deception, which is why they've evolved those features. Humans, however, work in cooperative societies that are led by gays. If you want someone to trust you, you must look them in the eye. So, some core ideas of empathy. We'll revisit empathy in a bit, in the self and performance bit. But lead with gaze. You need to look with people in the eye. And while, you know, things like remote work and all are picking up, if you re really want somebody to trust you, you need to look them in the eye, which is why face-to-face -face -face works best. Exercise the theory of mind and genuinely take another person's perspective. Just like the Sally Annie test that a four-year-old kid could do, uh, you should be able to put yourself into more complex situations as another human being. And to do that, you need more data. You need to know more about their worldview. So the more you know about another person, the more attention you pay to that person, you'll try to see what that person's daily work is like. And you, then you'll be able to you know, empathize with them a little more, which is why you're able to empathize with the people around you much more easily than you would empathize with some religious leader or, or somebody that you've never seen or some political leader or, or some celebrity, which is why we're more likely to attack celebrities on social media or attack some leaders on social media because we are not empathetic towards what they go through on a daily basis, right? We don't know anything and we are not going to step into their shoes because we cannot relate. Enforce compassionate responses give benefit of doubt because we don't know what the situation is. We don't know if somebody's come out and pulled out the marble, right? Empathetic leaders can build and maintain relationships with their subordinates, peers and superiors by exercising the theory of mind, which is by stepping into another person's shoes. Summarizing, empathy necessary skill to connect with other people's problems and needs, whether in the workflow force or for consumers. This is not just useful for your employees, right? It's also useful for your consumers. There's this famous story of how Jeff Bezos, you know, he'd keep a chair in all the meetings and he'd say that chair signifies the customer. We don't, we need to really figure out what the customer's needs are, what their problems are, and see if we can solve those instead of us trying to theorize and have some great ideas. Theory of mind lays in the groundwork for human cooperation, the ability to work together to get something. These trust-based endeavors are led by the human eye and followed by human language. We'll get into that in some future episodes, right? In social situations where you are outnumbered, your thoughts will mirror that of the society. It's herd mentality. This is actually an evolutionary adaptation. Most people are generally surprised when they are told that other people have diverse de desires and diverse needs and different needs of their own, right? People are genuinely surprised when you can tell them that, hey, somebody's voting for a different party. Hey, somebody uh, really likes this other thing. People get angry and confused when this happens. And that's weird because, you know, we have theory of mind. We should be able to do this. Being able to balance your own needs with the needs and desires of others in a cooperative way without... Being severely affected by herd mentality is the crux of management decision making, right? Now, herd mentality has its benefits. We'll come to that in a bit, especially when we talk about sales. Um, but the point is, how can you balance that along with your, you know, along with your needs and desires, along with managing other people's needs and desires? You have to find that perfect circle. In 2010, 50% of managers in the US workforce were considered ineffective. 50% half of managers, right? So, being a good manager is really about, it's a people problem. It's not about books or, or studies or, or this, you know, formula. It's about people. It's about managing people and understanding how they work in different situations and trying to figure out the best for yourself and the best for them at the same time. Right? So that's it for this video. In the next video, let's study a little more about uh, these evolutionary theories we're talking about.